<coughs> oh, good morning, friends. Well, let's have a word of prayer and come to the word of God. Lord, we thank you that we can read from your word and preach from your word. Just pray you bless and guide as we do this, Lord, and that you bless the children and the young people as they go out. And we do pray, Lord, for your word to go out and accomplish your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to open by uh, reading from Psalm 11. Psalm 11. In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, free as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness, his countenance beholds the upright. I want to think particularly about verse 3 today. If the foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Uh, there's a lot in the Bible about foundations, good foundations for a building, <clears throat> and it will stand even in an earthquake or a storm. If you have poor foundations, it will fall. Um, we're in a building, actually, which has very poor foundations. I don't know if you realize that. <laughs> it slopes away down to the side there because... Uh, Really, when it was built in 1911, they didn't put very good foundations into it. But it's still standing, praise the Lord. But it's important that a building has good foundations, and it, it stands. Poor foundations, it'll fall. Remember how Jesus told the story of the two house builders, one that built his house on the rock, one that built his house on the sand, and the storms and the floods came, the rains and the floods came, hit both of them, one of them fell down, the house on the sand fell down, and the house on this rock stood, stand, stood. And so what is the question about faith? What is the question about good foundations? Where do you get them from? Basically, it's based upon faith and obedience to the word of God. And this psalm asks the question, what happens if you find yourself living in a society, in a world in which the foundations have been destroyed? What do you do? Do you have two options, really? One of them is to flee like a bird to the mountains, the other is to trust in the Lord and to make known his righteousness. And if you do that, you may risk coming under attack from the evil one. But the Lord will defend you. So two options. One, find a escape. Find a safe place and hunker down till it's all over. Quite an attractive proposition. <laughs> Sometimes I think of it. You know, I've reached a stage in my life where actually I get a pension from the government. My house is paid off. I could actually quit everything and leave London and go and find somewhere quiet and forget about all this preaching and uh, like the last days and telling people about the judgments coming and that which might get me into trouble. Let's flee from the, like, uh, flee from the situation and have a peaceful life. Good option, yeah? On the other hand, I won't do it <laughs> because I want to trust in the Lord and to do his will and to make known his message. And there is a cost in doing that. You may be attacked by the wicked, and you may have opposition, but if the opposition comes, you have to trust in the Lord, and he will deal with it. Uh, Esther was reading through my notes this morning, and she said, well, the first which came to me was Psalm 37, and looked it up, and yeah, that's a good passage to read. I'll just read it. Uh, verses from Psalm 37. <clears throat> Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. They will soon be cut off, cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on the fa his faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring to pass. He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. 
Indeed, you shall look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Some good reasons there to trust in the Lord. Um, one reason is actually that if you trust in the Lord, you're on the victory side. And in the end, no matter what the wicked do, Jesus is going to have the last word. And he's going to bring peace and justice to the world. And those who trust in him are going to be in the right place. But coming back to the idea of the foundations, what were the foundations for Israel? What was This psalm was obviously written in the time of the uh, Israel in the land. And what were the foundations which God wanted them to have for their society? Uh, <clears throat> when you read in the, the, in the history of the Joshua going into the land, you see that after the entrance of the land of the Israelites into the promised land, the defeat of their enemies, their society was based upon the Torah, the law of God. And it was said that this was a feasible option. It wasn't something impossible, something they could do. They just trusted God and did his will. Obviously, there was a possibility they make the wrong choice worship other gods, in which case the foundation of faith would crumble. And the exhortation of Moses, but they went into the land, was to keep God's word, to make the right choice, that God would be with you, and he helped you to stand against your enemy. And a reminder that they would have an enemy, an enemy who would try to remove them from the land, and an enemy who is be hostile, and also that we also have an enemy, an enemy who wants to take us from the place where we are in God. I have an enemy who, according to Peter, says your enemy, the devil, Satan, goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. So a reminder, we do have an enemy who wants to take us from the place God wants us to be in. But getting back to Moses and the uh, entrance to the land, if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, just before they go in, Moses says, See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you will surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. That's the foundation which God wanted them to have, to walk in the ways of the Lord, uh, not to turn away and serve other gods, but to serve and worship the Lord your God and to keep his commandments and to cling to him. And if you do that, he says you're going to dwell in the land. You're going to be safe. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you. And you're going to dwell in peace and safety in the land which God gave to you. And when Joshua goes into the land, he uh, hears from the Lord uh, in chapter 1. Be strong and of good courage. This is Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage for this people... For to this people you should divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be very strong and courageous that you may observe to do according to the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you'll make your way prosperous, then you'll have good success." Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Pretty clear instructions, aren't they? Uh, and God tells him how to prosper in the land, how to be blessed in the land. Do everything according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn away from it. Don't go from the left to the right. Don't follow other gods. It says even meditate on it day and night. Think about it. Let it be part of your life. And that's the whole idea of the uh, Shema and the, 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 the blessing which God gave to think about it, to bless the Lord and to think about his word and to teach your children. And let it be the guide for your actions as you go into your home, as you go out into the community, as you, whatever you do, let it be done by the Lord. Let the Lord be the guiding of you. And be strong and courageous. 
for the Lord is with you, and he will be with you wherever you go. And we see that when Joshua went into the land after the first battles, he gathered the people together at a place called Gilgal, and he read to them the book of the law, Joshua chapter 8. Now Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of stone, whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it a burnt offering to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the children of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. Then all Israel with their elders and officers and judges stood on either side of the ark before the priests, the Levites, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as he who was born among them. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim, half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses said. The servant of the Lord had commanded, as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded before, that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. He read them all the words which Moses had given to them. And he said, this is going to be what you guide. This is going to be the foundation for your society. Uh, notice also he read all the words which Moses had commanded. And he, there was not a word which he did not read before the assembly of Israel. Uh, and one of the things which modern Jews say is that when God gave the law to Moses, he also gave the oral law, uh, the unwritten law. Not a mention of that anywhere in the Hebrew Scriptures. In other words, it's a fiction which was made up later. What God was based upon was the written law, not anything else. And God said that if you look according to this written law, then God will bless you in the land. And that will be the foundation for your society. And we read that in the beginning it was so, till the death of Joshua. And after the death of Joshua, they began to depart from it. You go to the book of Judges. The book of Judges is one of the saddest books in the Bible. It has some of the stories which are actually pretty much X-rated, which you wouldn't want to read to your children. But they tell about how the decline came from walking in the ways of the Lord to doing what they thought was right. In fact, it says everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Judges chapter 2, it says, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old, and they buried him within the border of his inheritance in Timnat Heres, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gaasa. And when all that generation who had gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. They bowed down to them, they provoked the Lord to anger, they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of their plunderers who despoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, so that they could not stand before their enemies." Whenever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot after, with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. When the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hands of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. And you read the book of Judges, that's pretty much a summary of what happened. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It says there was no king in Israel. They did according to their own understanding, not according to the written word of God. And it's important, actually, that they had a written word. One of the things about a written word is that if it's written down, it can't be changed. Well, you can delete it, but the actual word is there. It's in writing. 
if you're making up the rules as you go along, you can change them as you go along. And that's the problem which happens, that's the problem which happens in our society as well. That as you tow away from the written word which is written and which is fixed by God, then you begin to work up and make up your own rules. And as you make up your own rules and you make up your own gods and worship them instead of the true God, you end up in trouble, which is what happened to Israel. And we see in the book of Judges an example of what happens when the foundations are destroyed and everyone does what is right in his own eyes. And they become their own judges of what is right and wrong instead of what God says is right and wrong. And that's fundamentally one of the big problems which we face and which we'll go on to say about in our society today. And we see that ultimately this led to the dispersion, uh, the captivity in Babylon, and the restoration under Ezra. If you read through to Ezra, you'll find that the first thing which Ezra did when he came, brought the people back to the land was to do what Joshua had done, to read to them the word of the Lord and to base the returning community on the word of God so that from the time of Ezra onwards, they should be turning back to the one true God and basing their society on the word of the Lord. Even that went wrong because they then now started adding laws to laws and by the time you came to Jesus, they were following much more the traditions of the fathers than the actual word of God. And if you read in the New Testament, the arguments which Jesus has with the Pharisees are actually not about whether you should keep the Torah, but whether you should keep the additional laws which the Pharisees have brought in. And this led actually to the final uh, rejection of Yeshua, the Messiah, and the death of Jesus. And of course, that was all in the will of God so that you bring in a new covenant and that we should now be living under the new covenant. Led also to the dispersion of the Jewish people into the nations. And one of the interesting things which I was thinking about when I was giving this talk is that now we have Israel back in the land and a restoration which has taken place since 1948. And one of the questions then is what should be the foundation for faith or for society of the Jewish people as they come back to the land of Israel? And it's a question which actually came up even at the very beginning when uh, Ben-Gurion was... Uh, bring the people together and they sign what was called the, uh, <clears throat> the, the Declaration of Independence for the State of Israel in 1948, there was a big question about whether they should conclude it with trust in God. Okay, so should we conclude this with the words with trust in God? The rabbis and the religious amongst the uh, early Zionists wanted to put with trust in God. The secular humanists, especially from a group called Mapam, which was basically Marxist, said, no, we don't want mention of God. It's going to divide the people. They ended up with a compromise in which they said, with trust in Tzur Israel, which means in the rock of Israel. And uh, that's the word which was used in the Deuteronomy for, the, uh, for God. And Ben-Gurion said, well, if you want to believe that Tzur Israel is God, that's fine. If you want to believe Tzur Israel is the nation of Israel or the land of Israel, that's fine. Whatever it is, we'll just agree to have with Tzur Israel. But it's interesting they couldn't agree on actually putting the name of God into the Declaration of Independence. And it sets up the question uh, from the beginning of the State of Israel, what should be the foundation? What should they live upon? What uh, should be the uh, basis for faith and for society in the modern State of Israel as the Jews return from the different nations to the land of Israel? I remember talking to a uh, Israeli guy once and he said when he got off he was one of the early immigrants he came off the boat in Haifa somebody said to him Kol Israel mishpacha ahed, echad. the whole of Israel is one family he said he spent the next 20 years finding out that that wasn't the case <laughs> that actually there are two families or three families or different families which are striving to have the uh, basis for faith in the modern state of Israel the secular and the orthodox and the ultra-orthodox and basically, they don't agree. If you go to Israel, you can go to Tel Aviv, you can go to a very secular, modern society, nightclubs, everything else. Tel Aviv is actually known as the gay capital of the Middle East. So you have all kinds of influences which are pretty much against the Torah. Go a few miles further to Bnei Brak, which is an ultra-Orthodox city, and you'll find ultra-Orthodox Jews living according to the Torah, as they understand it. And the same in Jerusalem. You'll find <coughs> areas which are extremely orthodox, and areas which are <coughs> modern, uh, secular society. And you've got this two foundations. What should be the foundation? Now, of course, we live in the time after Yeshua. And since Yeshua has come, he has now replaced the Torah with the new covenant. 
So actually, what should be the foundation of modern Israel, in God's eyes, it should be faith in Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, which is rejected for different reasons by both the secular and the orthodox. And you have in the midst of it the Messianic Jews who believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. And actually, when you look at the Bible prophecies, one of the uh, <coughs> issues which is going to come in the last days as Israel is gathered together and the battle comes over Jerusalem is that the revelation of Yeshua is going to come to the Jewish people and they look upon me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. But in the meantime, there's this battle, if you like, on what should be the foundation for Israel. Should it be secular, Judea secular humanism, basically? Should it be orthodox Judaism? <clears throat> or some other round of Judaism. <clears throat> and it's a battle which is going on. And the answer actually is it should be neither. It should be Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. And you should pray for the Jewish people and for the Messianic Jews who are proclaiming this message, groups like One for Israel, which are effectively telling Jewish people how Yeshua is the Messiah and the answer. But we don't live in Israel, we live in Britain. So what about Britain? How does it apply to us? Uh, <clears throat> Now, you'd say that uh, many people think of England as a Britain, as a Christian country. Uh, is it a Christian country? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, fundamentally, this is a country which has been heavily influenced by Christianity. I can't deny that. Uh, in the 1870s, I think there was a uh, they did a survey. They found out that 70% of the population went to church on Sunday. Most of the children went to Sunday school of some form. So you had a very strong Christian influence in this country, you have to say. A lot of the institutions of this country, whether it's in the judiciary and the education system and the uh, royal family even, are based upon Christianity. <clears throat> you have the, queen, uh, the king and the queen as the defender of the faith. What you understand that as maybe can be a bit of strange, but we have generally an idea that in traditionally, Protestant Christianity is the faith of this country. Uh, <clears throat> this country saw great missionary work, went out around the world and took the gospel to different places around the world, uh, including places like Iran. We've got friends here from Iran. We had uh, great people who went to translate the Bible into Farsi, and uh, they all came from England. They went to Korea. <laughs> I think they went to Wales from Korea, didn't they? <laughs> but uh, we had... Christians going around the world preaching the gospel from this country. Uh, and God blessed for that reason. Many failings, slavery, all that stuff, bad things happened. But actually Christians also were in the forefront of fighting against slavery. And we had nominal Christianity, a lot of hypocrisy. But you have to say that the base was Christian. And, you know, I grew up in the 50s. I went to Bedford School. Um, I remember that most of... Uh, well, these, we, every day we had assemblies in which we sang Christian hymns. They said Christian prayers. RE was all Christian. Uh, I was vaguely aware that there were people who followed other religions, but I didn't know much about them. And it wasn't really an option. It wasn't anything I considered. Uh, when I was 13, I was confirmed in the Church of England, and that was what you did. And I was sort of vaguely... Uh, well, I was actually, at that time, I was quite searching for God. Uh, when it came to the punch and the bishop laid hands on me and said, receive the Holy Spirit, and nothing happened, I began to kind of uh, lose interest. And by the time I was in the sixth form, I was studying French and German and reading lots of uh, literature, which is actually quite anti-Christian, especially French existential philosophy. And I began to lose faith and become what I became at university, basically secular, Marxist-oriented. But basically, you have to say that the structure of society was Christian. Also, it was expected that it was understood, nobody questioned that marriage was between a man and a woman. Uh, I was vaguely aware there was something called homosexuality because when I went into, the, I was in the boarding school, we, uh, I went to, became a boarder at the school at 13 years old, and the uh, head of the, the house used to give us a sex lecture. <laughs> And in the course of the sex lecture, he mentioned something called homosexuality, which I was a bit confused about. He said, basically just said, don't do it. But, you know, it was not something which was really aware of. And certainly nobody ever heard anything about transsexuality. It was just not there. And the understanding was that, you know, basically, obviously people could break commandments in sex, but the rule was 
one man, one woman married to each other should be the basis of a sexual union, having the children. That was understood. Uh, <clears throat> but then uh, things began to change. The time I went to university in the mid-60s, we were into the 60s and uh, all the changes which were taking place then. Sex, drugs and rock and roll and that became part of uh, my lifestyle as well. And we saw the, uh, also the Beatles going to India and bringing in ideas of Hinduism and yoga and all that stuff. Uh, Bob Dylan singing The Times Are Changing. And I thought, yeah, the times are changing. Let's change from this traditional society. Let's have a new world order, a new kind of society in which we will live according to new laws. And they brought in new laws about homosexuality, about abortion. And we saw a gradual change in society, which uh, has had huge impl implications for modern times. And that's uh, really where we're at today, isn't it? And we saw that the BBC, for example, was actually based upon it with a charter, uh, and it had a Christian basis. If you go into the BBC building in All Soul, near All Souls in Langham Place today, you'll find it has a plaque in Latin, so that probably no one reads it, but it says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. <laughs> so it should have a, basically, that's, obviously, if you know that's a verse from Philippians, they should do what's praiseworthy and good and Christian. And by the time you got to the mid-60s, the BBC became a major channel of anti-Christian propaganda, all kinds of hostile things coming up. Uh, Mary Whitehouse, anybody remember her? She was <laughs> campaigning for cleaning up TV, uh, getting rid of all the filth and all the uh, anti-God and anti-Christ stuff which was coming through. And she was largely ridiculed and mocked and uh, dismissed by those who were running the organisation. And as you see, these things were happening, so the foundation of faith was being destroyed. So basically, although much by, even by the time I was a young person, much of Christianity was nominal, it was fundamentally Christian. By the time this process had com completed, which we are now, we see that the Christian base has been more or less destroyed. And we see also that the church has lost its faith. Much of the church today preaches liberal theology, accepts evolution, says no to creation, uh, no to the miracles, no to prophecy. Even the divinity of Jesus is in question, and the virgin birth, the resurrection, some of the churches are questioning that. And as far as the second coming is concerned, forget all about it. Don't even mention it. And yet we see the fact that we're living in a time when all the prophecies are coming to pass, and it should be the high on the agenda. But we see so much of the church today has given away from the roots, which are the foundation open also to multi-faith and worshipping other gods and bringing all the gods together to one. As I said, when I was at school, I was aware that there were people who believed other things and there were other religions. There was something called Islam, but it was what other people did and it was miles away from us and who cares? <laughs> That's their, their problem. Now we find that it's being imposed upon us all the time. Back in the early 70s, after I'd become a Christian, I had a job at a place called uh, Tulsa School in Brixton. I've told you a bit about this in the past. Uh, I was teaching RE, uh, which I had actually no qualification to do, but I was teaching RE because they worked out I was vaguely Christian and they thought needed someone to uh, teach RE, so they gave me the job. Uh, and for three years I taught Christian RE, nothing else. <laughs> and uh, it was mainly, um, most of the uh, pupils there were Caribbean, they knew uh, in that time, we were fairly new immigrants came in the 60s from the West Enders. Uh, most of them had some kind of Christian base in their homes. So, though a lot of the boys were going away from it, there was some sort of Christian foundation there. Nevertheless, the school was also a target for Marxist, humanist, uh, white revolutionaries who went in there to teach the black kids how to become. Uh, anti-God and anti-society. And I had a lot of conflicts with them. But one of the things which came out from this was that they, the Marxists, the humanists, said that this is a multiracial school, therefore you shouldn't be teaching Christian education, you should teach multi-faith religion. Uh, now, that didn't come from the Caribbeans, it came from the white Marxists. 
which is basically the trend which you've seen in this country, that they've used immigration and multi-faith as a prop to attack Christianity and to remove Christianity as the basis for our society. And in the end, we had to teach RE from a multi-faith religion, and I left. But uh, that's part of the thing which is happening in our society. And you see also that the left making alliances with Islam also to attack Christianity and to attack Israel. Speaking about the left, there's something called cultural Marxism. Anybody heard of that? Um, <coughs> back in, this is quite interesting. Um, I hope you don't think I'm getting too political, but it's interesting because back in the uh, 1930s, there was a man called Gramsci, who was an Italian communist in, 19, in the 18, 1930s. And he put forward a doctrine that uh, basically the workers' revolution was not going to happen uh, as it happened in Russia in the communist revolution. Uh, what, they need, what the Marxists needed to do was to take over and capture institutions like education, the media, the judiciary, the social services, even the church, and take over institutions and make them a means which they can then use to propagate their ideas. In fact, in Gramsci's time, Europe was taken over by fascism, but in the post-war time, a lot of people leapt onto this idea. So communism established in Eastern Europe, which was atheistic and anti-God. But in Western Europe, you had the opportunity to change Western liberal democracy. And Western Marxists saw the relevance of Gramsci's doctrine, and you have what we call now the woke kind of idea. Use minority groups, LGBT, uh, use other groups to impose their ideas upon society and to get rid of Christianity. You see what's happening. Uh, even use anti-racism to attack traditional Christian values and to say that we have to have uh, all religions being equal and actually then attack Christianity as a basis for society. You have humanism trying to eliminate God. And the ultimate aim of this actually is to remove Christian teaching and Christian base from society. And it's been pretty effective. Uh, you now have the conversion therapy bill, which is before parliament. Uh, understand what that means. They're saying that uh, you mustn't try to convert homosexuals or change homosexuals from, into being heterosexual. Uh, now, there are people who've done that in a forceful and a harmful way. But when you look at what they're saying, they're also saying that if you try to, uh, if, even if you pray with somebody who has homosexual feelings and pray that they might uh, be set free from these, that is abusing them of their identity and should not be allowed to happen. If you're teaching things which you say that it's a sin and that they should repent of it, that's also something which is wrong and should not be allowed to happen. If you follow this through, it's actually saying that you're not allowed to teach people that they should be converted, that they should change from their sin to, to, to following Jesus Christ. And you can see this as part of the thin end of the wedge to actually prevent uh, evangelism, evangelism and the teaching of Christianity in our society. And the ultimate goal is to prevent Christian and biblical teaching. Now, who's behind that? Whose idea is that? Well, pretty obvious, isn't it? And to take control of the opinion and suppress alternatives. Control opinion in education, in the media, and in government. And if you say something else, you find yourself uh, under attack. And that's what's happened today, isn't it? And if you go against the flow, against the flow of this, you're going against what they want you to say. And we have also in the Church of England, we have bishops who are pretty much ashamed of speaking the gospel. They just teach a social agenda. They teach about climate change and racism and all that stuff. But they don't teach people the gospel about Jesus Christ. Uh, recently at the Church of England Synod, uh, somebody asked the question, what is the Church of England's definition of a woman? Uh, in his response, Dr. Richard Robert Innes, the church's, church's bishops in Europe, Chairman of the Faith and Order Commission declared there is currently no official de definition of a woman. In other words, they're going along with the transgender gender agenda of sex change as a legitimate option. If the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? And what you're seeing is the foundations of faith being destroyed at every level in our society. So what do the righteous do? Do you flee as a bird to the mountain? In other words, forget it, just go and live in your own private life. And that's always been an option, I guess. In some ways, you know, actually going into a monastery in the Middle Ages was 
kind of that option. <laughs> Let's get out of society and just live in our own religious community. Lord, have anything to say. But God doesn't want us to do that. He does want us to have a voice. and He wants us to be calling a corrupt society to repent and to believe in the gospel in Jesus Christ. And he's calling us to have a faith in the Lord and to trust in the Lord and do his will. And whatever happens in the world, whatever happens in the world is actually outside of our control. What we can do is trust in God and do his will and pray that they may repent, but also make sure that we don't follow them and we make sure that we don't compromise in what we believe. I want to conclude with three passages from Matthew's Gospel, which I believe tell us about what the foundation should be and what we should be doing in response to this situation which has come into this nation. First, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, which is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Where Jesus says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus ended these sayings that people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus did have authority, and that, as I said, this is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. So to understand this, you've got to read the Sermon on the Mount. But for sake of time, I won't do that. Uh, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells you how to live in the new covenant, in the new society, which he's bringing about. But he says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them is like a man who built his house on the rock. And the rains came and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. So what's the answer? The answer is to build your life upon the rock of faith in Jesus Christ. Notice that the rains and the floods come to both houses. Whether you build on the house, on the rock, or on the sand, both houses are going to be subjected to the same problem of the rains and the floods coming. The difference is that one stands and the other falls. And if we are in this world, whether we're believers or not, we're going to face the same temptations, the same uh, trials, the same issues which the people in the world feel. The difference between the person who is putting their trust in Jesus is that the person who puts their trust in Jesus is going to stand against those temptations, against those trials, person who does not and who rejects Jesus and who doesn't live according to his will will fall. It's quite simple. There's a choice which Jesus says is before you. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount he said there are two ways you can go. A broad way which leads to destruction and a narrow way which leads to life. And you have a choice to make that, cho that, that choice in which road you're going to go on. I don't believe we're totally predestined to make that choice by the way. We have to make the choice ourselves. And we have to choose righteousness, to choose to follow God, and to choose to reject the evil one. And if we do that, we know that God's going to be with us. And no matter what trials we come, and if you're a believer, you'll face trials. Uh, and all of us here have faced trials. We face trials through the COVID time. You face trials with sickness. You face trials with uh, money. And uh, yeah, I think they're going to get more difficult in the days to come. But whatever trials we face, whatever difficulties we face, if we face them and we're based upon the rock of faith in Jesus, we're going to stand. And the challenge to us is to do that, to build our lives on the rock of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can testify that although I've sometimes submitted to temptation and done what's wrong, if you repent and believe the gospel, God's going to be with you and help you through it. And God's going to give you grace to continue and to stand in these days. And we can thank God that there is a power behind the word of God and behind the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who is available to everyone who puts their trust in Jesus. So the first lesson which he tells us is to build on the rock, build on the rock of faith and obedience to the Lord and to what he tells us. And remember that he is the one who has authority. Ultimately, all authority is given to Jesus. He's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, 
he's now reigning in heaven and he's able to deliver on the promises which he gives in his word. Second passage from Matthew's Gospel uh, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, about building the church on faith in the Lord Jesus. Uh, Matthew 16, verse 13, uh, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Then Peter said, answered and said, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now we give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed on earth, in heaven. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, for this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get, beside me, get behind me, Satan. You are an offence to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What does it profit a man to gain his, if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? So a man will come in the glory of his father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Uh, Jesus asked the question to the disciples, who do you say that I am? Are you one of the prophets? Are you a great man? And Simon answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Peter says that this is something which has been revealed for you from heaven. It's not just your opinion. This is the truth. This is what God has revealed to you. That Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, if we're going to base our church, our faith upon anything, we have to base it upon that faith. That Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And he, Jesus says that... Uh, you are Peter, on this rock I will build my church. Uh, according to Roman Catholicism, that means that the church is going to be built upon Peter, the rock, uh, as the first of the disciples, the leader of the disciples. But actually, if you look in the original Greek, you'll find that uh, the word for Peter is Petros, which actually means a small pebble. The word for this rock here is Petra, which is a great foundation stone. Uh, so he's not saying you're going to build it upon Peter the man, you're going to build it upon Peter has just said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Therefore the foundation is on Jesus Christ, and he is the foundation for faith in our time. And there was a scripture which I meant to read earlier, which uh, actually tells us this. Uh, yeah, I missed this one out. <laughs> Can you go back to it? Uh, says in Corinthians, uh, verse 1 Corinthians uh, 1, verse 19. It's up in there. We, you are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. There is no other foundation any, can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. There's no other foundation which anyone can lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And going back to Matthew, Jesus Christ has told us that the foundation also involves believing that he will die literally a death on the cross and rise from the dead. Peter's first reaction was to deny that could happen, but it was going to happen. And Peter, Jesus goes on to say, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You've got to come back to the cross, always come back to the cross. That's where the transaction took place, which determines whether we go to heaven or hell. 
and when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and accept him as saviour. So he says there's no other foundation you can build except Jesus Christ, and he also says that we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, to the Greeks' foolishness, to both to those who are, those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, the Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So it comes back to Jesus Christ and him crucified. Crucified, died for our sins, and rose from the dead. There's no other foundation you can build upon. And if the church goes away from that foundation, it's not a church anymore. It's finished. It's a religious organization. And we have a lot of religious organizations, unfortunately, uh, up and down through the country, which are not based upon Jesus Christ and him crucified. And if they're not based on Jesus Christ and him crucified, in the end, they will disappear. Because that's the only basis upon which we can build our lives. And Paul goes on to say, Do you not know that you are the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Uh, you are the temple of the living God. And we are the temple of the living God by the Holy Spirit as we're building our lives upon Jesus Christ and him crucified. And if we do that, it's going to stand. And he also tells us in Corinthians what we're to build upon this foundation. Uh, there's this uh, phrase in verse 12 where he says in 1 Corinthians uh, th 3 verse 12 where it says, If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. The day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. What's the difference between gold, silver and precious stones and wood, hay and stubble? If you put one lot through the fire, the gold, it's going to be refined and will come out as gold. If you put wood, hay and stubble through the fire, what's going to happen to it? It'll be burned up. And the gold, silver and precious stones actually speaks about what we do with our lives, which is based upon faith and obedience to the Lord. And if we do that, it's going to stand. And no matter what trials come against us, it will stand, and we will stand as believers. We build with wood, hay, and stubble. That actually speaks about our own good deeds, our own works. They're going to be burned up. And on the Day of Judgment, they're going to be burned up. And actually speaks there about a reward for those who <coughs> build with, the, wood, with the, the gold, silver, and precious stones, and those who build with wood, hay, and stubble suffer loss. Actually, even if you build with wood, hay, and stubble, stubble you're still going to be saved because you're saved by faith in Jesus. But you're going to lose something. You lose your reward. And the, what God wants us to do is to build with faith, using faith and obedience to the Lord on the right foundation. And what we build is built with that which will stand in the day of trouble. So we have this word here, not just about the foundations, but what we build the rest of the building with. And in both cases, it's got to be built on Christ Jesus, him crucified, and upon faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have the answer in this passage. And as I said, the central point of what Jesus is saying then in Matthew 16 is his death, his resurrection. And therefore, Christianity, true Christianity, must always focus back on the cross where Jesus paid the price for the sin of the world, where he died and rose again from the dead to give eternal life to all those who believe in him. If that's not our message, then we have no message, and we might as well pack up. But we do have this message, and it's true. So we don't pack up, and we give this message to the world. Which brings me to my last point. Going back to the foundations of faith, the last words of Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus promised here he's going to be with you even to the end of the age. He's going to be with you now as we approach the end of the age. And he tells us to go in his name and to preach the gospel, to tell people about Jesus. He says, all authority, heaven and earth, has been given to me. No matter how much is challenged by our society and no matter how much even they may mock and deride the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ, they can do what they like. All authority is given to Jesus Christ. And in the end, 
all of the people who mock and scoff are going to stand before him and give account of what they've done with their lives. And uh, at the end, there will be no unbelievers because everyone will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Unfortunately, if they wait until they die, it's too late. And they know that Jesus is Lord, but they know that they've missed it and they end up forever separated in hell, which is not what God wants for us. He wants us to be ready to meet with the Lord so that we can have eternal life in him. But he tells us to go and preach the gospel and to make known the message of Jesus Christ. And you can do that whatever the situation in society. Uh, it actually doesn't matter if the society is an anti-Christian one, as in China or in Iran or in other countries. It doesn't matter if the authorities are as anti-Christ as you like. You can still share the gospel. It may cost you your life, but you can still do it. <laughs> Uh, so it's an option which is always there before the Christian church. And Jesus says to go and to make this message known. So don't run like a bird to the mountain, don't flee away, but stand firm and trust in the Lord and do his will. And make known his message. Uh, and if we have a purpose here at Bridge Lane, is to make known the message of Jesus the Messiah to the people around about us, share the gospel, tell them that Jesus is Lord and encourage them to put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we want to do. That's what we do with the evangelism, what you can do personally in talking to people you know, encouraging them to believe in Jesus, sharing the gospel, giving out our leaflets, whatever. Uh, I've actually produced a new leaflet. I don't know if I can find it here. Uh, advertising the Sunday meetings. I think I've left it behind somewhere, but it's on the table. Uh, Medium Flora just been a spent the last two days passing them out in the uh, houses round about here in Golders Green and we'll be doing that for the next couple of weeks and we can get the message out tell people that Jesus is Lord tell people to come and to believe in him and if we do that God's going to be with us and Jesus says that's the foundation foundation of faith so coming back what are the three things we can do which won't be shaken Build our lives on the rock of faith and obedience to the Lord. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, who died and risen from the dead. And share the good news. Preach the gospel. Take this message to all nations and know that God is with us even to the end of the age. So praise God. Build on the foundation, foundation of faith. And no matter how much the foundations may crumble and be undermined in our society, those three things you can still do. And the devil can rage as much as he likes. But Jesus is going to have the last word. And if you put your trust in Jesus, you're on the victory side. So praise the Lord. Jesus is coming. And he's coming with power and glory to judge the world in righteousness. Meantime, we have a job to do. Get the message out. And to tell people the way of salvation through faith in Jesus. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Then we'll sing our final hymn. Lord, we do thank you that you've made a strong foundation for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we see the crumbling of the foundations in our society, even in much of the church, the visible church, we pray, Lord, that you help us to build our lives on the rock of faith and to obey you, to do your will. And we pray you help us also, Lord, to take the message out to the world and the people will be saved through faith, repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.